Hey everyone and welcome back. If you're an OG subscriber of the channel here from all the way back in 2018, then you may have remembered the time that I made a video around Phil Town's 10 cap method and the one and only Phil Town himself commented on that video. And that happening was so amazing to me. I remember feeling so good about it because I just created my YouTube channel. It was less than a year old and I was making a lot of content around Phil Town's books and his different strategies. But this week, as I was looking over some of my old content that I'd made a few years ago, I realized there's a number of things that are really critical to investing that I hadn't spoken about on the channel uh, in favor of talking about more news related topics. So every now and then I want to sprinkle in some deep investing lessons and today is going to be one of them around Phil Town's 10 cap stock valuation method. So in today's video, very simply, I'm gonna go through what the 10 cap method is and how it relates to real estate and the stock market as it's a method of valuation that originates in real estate. I'm gonna give you a full example on my computer and I'm also going to be sharing something that I didn't in my old video from 2018 which is some of the limitations to this method so um, while it is a great way to begin approaching valuation and figuring out what a business may be worth and what you're willing to pay for it uh, it's uh, not perfect there's limitations to it and I want to compare it to the method I actually use today to see why I use this method versus the 10 cap method just before we get into this video just a friendly reminder Reminder that we are near the end of November where myself and a team of finance creators on YouTube led by Investing With Tom have been raising funds for men's health by growing uh, mustache and uh, I haven't had much success. You probably can't even see it from there, but uh, but I tried, right? And uh, I wanted to participate in this and we're getting towards the end of the month. We've raised a ton of money. I'm gonna be donating my entire YouTube ad revenue check from November into the fund uh, or to the cause. So uh, if you want to donate, I would very much appreciate it. And you can via the link down in the description below. If you do get some value out of today's video, I'd very much appreciate it if you could leave a like on the video and hit subscribe if you want to stay up to date with the content that I post in the future. But with that, that said, let's jump into the video. So first of all, what does Phil Town mean when he says 10 cap? Well, what he's talking about is targeting a 10% capitalization rate or a cap rate. And if you've been investing in the stock market, particularly if you're new, you may not have heard of the cap rate before. And the reason for that is because it's actually not traditionally a stock market valuation method. It's actually a real estate valuation method. The cap rate in real estate takes the net operating income and divides it by the market value of the property. And once you do that calculation of net operating income divided by the value of the property or the price of the property, you're essentially getting a percentage yield of the return you would make from the profits produced by that property compared to the price that you're paying for that property. And then in Phil Town's book, Invested, he introduces the use of the 10 cap method for stock valuation. And Phil Town in Invested applies the 10 cap method the same way or pretty much the same way that you apply it in real estate. You're taking a profit figure from the business, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, and dividing it by the price you're paying for the business. And then you're aiming for a 10% or higher capitalization rate. So you want the profit from the business from the last year to be higher than 10%, 10% or higher than the price of the business. The only real difference here is the type of profit figure that we're using. So in the real estate example, we're using net operating income. And as I said, it's relatively simple. You have rent, interest and maintenance expenses. When it comes to a business, it's a little bit more complicated, but what we can use is Warren Buffett's owner's earnings figure for cash flow. And this is just a quick reminder that if you haven't read all of Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder letters written by Warren Buffett, then I highly, highly recommend that you go and do it because this is not the only thing that's in there. There is a ton of valuable investing principles that he teaches and has taught over the past 50 years. In that specific letter, he describes owner's earnings as reported earnings plus depreciation, depletion, amortization, and other non-cash charges, and then subtract the average amount of annual capital expenditures for plant and equipment that the business requires to maintain its long-term competitive position 
and its unit volume. So owner's earnings, the figure we use for profit actually doesn't come from the income statement, although we, we do use the last line of the income statement, which is net income. But then we take that figure and we go to the cash flow statement and we add back non-cash charges and we subtract capital expenditure to get to a more accurate picture of how much cash is left over after the normal operations of the business. And then of course, once we've calculated that owner's earnings figure, we simply divide it by the market capitalization, which is the price for the entire business. So we're looking at price uh, in terms of the whole company, not on a per share basis. The market cap for those who are unaware is the stock price multiplied by the number of shares outstanding. So it gives you essentially the price for the entire business. And by doing that, we are able to calculate the cap rate. And we of course are targeting using the 10 cap method, a 10% or higher rate. Now for me personally, I don't actually use the exact owner's earnings figure that Warren Buffett describes in his annual letter, I use a simplified version of it that I call cash flow for owners. Cash flow for owners is a simple calculation of operating cash flow minus maintenance capital expenditure. And even though my formula looks a lot more simpler than Warren Buffett's, it's actually extremely similar. The only difference is that mine is taking into account all of the cash in and out of the business and getting a more accurate true picture of the cash produced and left over after normal operations. So taking into account things like the purchase or sell down of inventory. Now there's good reasons why you might want to not include working capital changes like changes in inventory. Um, a business could purchase a bunch of inventory in one particular year and that would cause the figure to be lower than other years or the opposite could happen. So there are good reasons why you might not want to include working capital. But in most circumstances, especially if you're taking averages of cash flow for owners over say a three, five or a 10 year period when you're doing your valuation, uh, those kinds of impacts are tend to be mitigated. And when it comes to the types of businesses that we're looking to invest in, we're looking for no brainer deals. We're looking for businesses that are such great companies and are are such at a such great price that little changes to the formula here and there are not going to make a difference as to whether it's a good investment. So I think it's probably not worth the time figuring out whether you should be adding inventory or not adding inventory and focusing on finding really great companies and buying them when they are at an absolute no brainer price. So now I just wanna jump over to my computer and show you how to calculate this. I'll show you with an owner's earnings example using Warren Buffett's formula. And then I'll also use mine using my free stock analysis spreadsheet. All right, so over on my computer now, we're gonna run through a couple of examples. One will be calculating the cap rate using owner's earnings, Warren Buffett's method, and then one using cash flow for owners, which is pretty much the same as owner's earnings. It's just a simpler approach to it. So again, just a quick reminder, the capitalization rate is owner's earnings divided by the market capitalization. And we are aiming for a, using this method, a 10% or higher cap rate. Um, so of course that means we have to calculate owner's earnings and we also need to find the market cap. The hardest part of that of course is finding owner's earnings, which uh, according to Warren Buffett is net income plus non-cash charges that we can find on the cash flow statement and then minusing or subtracting maintenance capital expenditure. So um, spending on long-term assets, um, maintenance spending, replacement spending, and that sort of thing on long-term assets. So using Thor Industries as an example, as it's my largest investment, and I'll explain a little bit later why I'm using this particular business as an example, um, we can come down and go to the latest annual report or the 10K um, in order to find their financial statements. The first figure from the financial statements uh, that we're going to need is from the income statement. So um, the first figure, of course, we need is net income. And the latest year's net income for 2021 for this business was 660.87 million. So we can kind of uh, enter that here, 660 point, we'll just round it. And we want to add then the non-cash charges on the cash flow statement. So coming down to the cash flow statement, um, there's a number of non-cash charges here that are being added back. So we've got depreciation, amortization of intangibles, amortization of debt, uh, imp and impairment charges. Those are the non-cash charges. So first we need to add all of those together and then we're going to be adding them back to net income. So those non-cash charges add together for 246 million. So we'll be adding that back. Uh, and then we're going to be subtracting maintenance capital expenditure. So you can simply find capital expenditure in the annual report by doing a search for it. And usually there will be a section where they describe how much the company spent 
on capital expenditure. So here you can see um, that uh, they describe capital expenditure as 106 or 100, 106.7 million. And most companies will end there. They will just tell you what total capital expenditure is, which is a little bit disappointing because then we have to come up with an estimate of what is spent on maintenance. Now, some companies, some management teams give us as much information as possible. They're completely transparent about how they spend money within the business. Um, so like Thor Industries, for example, they tell us that 51 million was spent on land and production building additions and improvements while the remainder was used to replace machinery and equipment used in the ordinary course of business. So um, what we can interpret from that is that if we take 107 million or 106.7 million and subtract what was spent on improvements and additions, we will be left with how much was spent on the replacement and, and maintenance of machinery and equipment, which is what we want. So we can do 106.7 uh, minus 51.1 and that gives us maintenance capital expenditure of 55.6 and we can subtract that from our calculation here, which gives us 851.3 million uh, in owner's earnings. Now, there's actually one other thing you will see in regards to capital expenditure from companies. So some businesses will just tell you the total figure and that's it. Some businesses will explicitly tell you what was used as growth capex and what was used to replace machinery and what was maintenance capex. Uh, and some businesses, it'll be halfway in the middle. So take Texas Roadhouse, for example, um, and if I just scroll down a little bit, um, they don't explicitly say what is spent on maintenance, but they give us a bit of detail about how the CapEx is spent and we can figure out from this description what might be maintenance. So money spent on new restaurants, for example, is probably going to be growth capital expenditure, um, whereas maybe uh, refurbishment or relocation could be considered maintenance or in this case, I guess you could partially consider some of this growth as it might contribute to more revenue at the comp at, at the restaurant. But for the most part, it's going to be um, leaning on the maintenance side. The market capitalization for a company is super easy to find. You don't have to calculate it. Just head over to something like Yahoo Finance and you'll be able to find it. So for Thor Industries, it's currently uh, 6 billion. Um, so we can put that in here and we'll keep everything in millions just to keep it nice. Uh, and consistent, therefore the cap rate would be 851.3 uh, divided by uh, 6,010, which is 14.2%. So going by the cap rate method, uh, this business would fall into a range that we would be happy with. Now I'll talk about this a little bit later in the limitations section of this video, but um, this is why I think the cap rate has limitations because Thor Industries is right now going through a boom and they're a cyclical business, it's very likely that their owner's earnings figure is going to decline at some point over the next couple of years, which means this cap rate of 14%, while it looks great, is actually misleading. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, limitations to this uh, method later and actually another method that um, I think makes a lot more sense. And then really quickly, uh, the way that I would calculate this, um, so again, cash flow for owners divided by market cap. Cash flow for owners is calculated very simply as operating cash flow minus minus maintenance capital expenditure. So just on the cash flow statement, you can find operating cash flow as this last line here, net cash provided by operating activities for this business, it is 526. And then we simply subtract maintenance capex, which we already worked out up here, which was 55. Uh, 0.6. So we can subtract that. And that gives us cash flow for owners of 470.9. The market cap is still 6 billion. Uh, and therefore the cap rate would be 470.9 divided by 6 billion, which gives us a cap rate of 7.8. So towards the end of this video, I just want to talk a little bit about a couple of limitations to this method and why I actually don't use the 10 cap method specifically, although I use a fairly similar valuation model that still uses owner's earnings or cash flow for owners. The first limitation is that this is a real estate valuation method and there's a reason why it works best in real estate and that is because the profit in real estate tends to not change too much year to year, right? Rents don't really change too much over time. Maintenance expenses probably won't change too much over time. So it makes sense to take a look at last year's profit figure and compare it to the price for the business because last year's profit 
profit figure from the property is likely to be very, very similar to next year's and the year after and the year after that. But with a business, that is certainly not the case. Of course, with some businesses, their profit figure from last year will be extremely similar to the next year, to the next year, to the next year. You can think of maybe really mature businesses that don't have much growth in them. But a lot of businesses have significant declines in their profits or significant increases in their profits. And therefore, just comparing last year's earnings to the price doesn't really give you a representation of what return you're getting out of that business. And that's why I use a discounted cash flow, which is actually the method that Warren Buffett has used over time in order to value businesses. He uses that owner's earnings figure, but instead of just sticking it into a cap rate, for example, he puts it into a discounted cash flow, which only takes into consideration last year's cash flow, but more importantly, the growth of cash flow over time, and therefore coming up with a calculation of the total amount of cash that the business can deliver to you over its remaining life. And this is a much better method because what ultimately matters is the cash that the business produces for you in the future, not what they produced last year. Now, if last year's cash flow is very similar to the next 10 years of cash flows, then sure, last year's cash flow can be a good indication of what you should pay for a business, like in a real estate investment. But with most businesses or businesses we're interested in, great companies that have the ability to compound and grow, we're actually willing to pay quite a bit more for those businesses because last year's cash flow is likely going to be much smaller than next year's or the year after that and the year after that. I have a number of videos on my channel talking about discounted cash flow and how to use my free stock analysis spreadsheet in order to do it. So I'll leave a couple of resources down in the description below. You can download the free spreadsheet, which I made an update to just last week. And I'll leave a couple of tutorial videos as well if you're interested in checking those out. But I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section about this particular method, whether it's something you use or maybe you use it in combination with Phil Town's other methods or with the discounted cash flow, leave a like on the video if you got some value and uh, hit subscribe if you want to stay up to date with content that I post in the future. But with that said, hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.